Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the premiere of In the Sliver of the Sun, featuring paintings by Maya Rusnik, the newest show at the Harwood Museum of Art. I'm Nicole, Curator of Exhibitions and Collections here at the museum, and joining me is our artist, Maya. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start with a little bit of background. Uh, Maya, you were born in former Yugoslavia, now Bosnia-Herzegovina, in 1983. Mm -hmm. You fled the Bosnian War with your mother in 1992, mm -hmm. were in refugee camps for a few years, including in Austria, and then migrated to the United States in 1995, where you were in San Francisco, mm -hmm. where you later worked there for a few years, and then moved to Los Angeles. And then in 2017, you came to New Mexico when your husband, Josh, Josh Hogler, who's also a great painter, uh, got the residency in Roswell, the Roswell Artist in Residence Program. That's right, yeah. Which brings us to 2020 and these paintings, which you created all during the coronavirus pandemic, correct? That's correct. Yes. Um, so I, I made these paintings. I remember you gave me a call. It was March of last <laughs> year. I was five months pregnant. The lockdown maybe hasn't happened yet, or if it was a few days before or after, I can't quite remember. But I remember, you know, having this invitation to do my first museum show and the world kind of seeming like it was going into chaos. Um, so yeah, it was a really intense moment for me to be making these. I was pregnant and I had this incredible opportunity. So um, it was kind of a dark time and in the sense that there was a lot of potential, but also the pandemic made everything so scary. Mm -hmm. And I, I was noticing a big um, kind of shift of consciousness already, like on social media um, with everything that was going on. So um, I titled this show In the Sliver of the Sun because our cat Judith, named after Judith Butler, who we love, <laughs> um, would migrate around the house wherever there, the sun was to sort of relax and soothe herself and take naps. And in some way, I felt like she was foreshadowing what we would all seek in the year to come mm -hmm. was a sense of comfort. So Judith became sort of like my um, mascot for this body of work, which depicts all these figures seeking or relishing in these moments of moonlight or sunlight, these kind of glimmers of hope. And that sort of use of your artwork or that, that device of your artwork to create this space for us to process cultural trauma or find yeah. respite or rest is something that's sort of interwoven throughout many of the works that you've created. Yeah. Um, and also that feeling of being alone, feeling solitary, feeling, feeling solitude and longing for the touch of someone you yeah. love or the embrace of someone you love. Mm. Um, I think that that's continued on from before the pandemic. Absolutely. I'm looking at, you know, at your background and your childhood and processing that right. trauma and now us all processing the cultural trauma of this year, which extends beyond COVID. This year has been traumatic in a, a lot of ways. In so many ways, yes, absolutely. I mean, I've been interested in trauma for as long as I've been making art. I mean, even before, mm -hmm. I studied psychology in college and art, and I've always been interested in um, my own family who, uh, you know, we are, um, you know, we were refugees uh, and trauma in so many different ways has manifested itself in my family, in my home country, in the people uh, that I grew up with. So yeah, it's always been something that I'm paying attention to. You know, I feel like our early years sort of prime what we are attracted to later mm -hmm. on as adults. I really believe that. So yeah, this, um, this most recent traumatic moment that we're in with the pandemic um, just somehow heightened this, this turmoil that was always right below the surface. At the time that I was making these, um, I think at some point during them, uh, George Floyd was murdered and there were all the protests going on. Uh, Trump was our president. Uh, there were just so much heat and anger and, uh, but at the same time, I just feel like things were turning and it mm -hmm. seemed like uh, the moment was pivoting towards something better. But for the meantime, we were all kind of stuck in the dirt of it uh, and the pandemic closed the doors literally and metaphorically. Mm -hmm. We were afraid to touch one another. We were told to stand apart like we are now. So everything just seemed um, humans started seeming really scary, you know, 
uh, for the obvious reasons, but also this kind of um, fear that he would notice when you were going to the grocery store or uh, ordering things online, just like fear of one another. Um, so the figures in my work, often they're kind of reaching for each other or embracing or sort of doing this like Reiki kind of energy transfer work with each other because it was something that I felt I yearned for. And I strongly believe that whatever it is that we feel strongly in our own bodies, it's probably felt amongst others. So my own desire for touch, for embrace, for something more tender and gentle um, that I just couldn't find anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was inflamed when I would get on, on my phone, the news, uh, social media, and it just felt like the entire world was um, going through an enormous infection and it was throwing mm -hmm. up. So um, I, I really believe that artists are shamans in some ways. So to do my own sort of shamanic work, I, I went to painting as a place of meditation, as a place for prayer, as a place where I could believe that we as humans are more than what was happening mm -hmm. in the moment that I was made, which was a lot of ugliness. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to believe that we are better than what was happening in the world, knowing that I was bringing a child into the world. Right. Um, so I, I really think that insistence on hope was something that I had a lot to do with being pregnant. Mm -hmm. Something I learned about being a mother and even while I was pregnant is that you cannot despair. And I realized that despairing for too long was almost indulgent, you know, in its own way and kind of decadent. And when you have a little life that you're raising, it's your duty to um, be responsible and to teach them that hope is a great motivator to be a dynamic figure in society, uh, a member that can contribute. Right, and your family members show up frequently in your works. Yeah. Um, Mila, your new baby, yeah. is in a few of the works mm -hmm. in this room, yeah. and also your ancestors are in the work behind us. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I've talked about trauma for a long time, and recently I realized that Something I haven't talked about as much as I should have maybe and that I'm starting to talk about right now is that my work has always dealt with like familial issues. Mm -hmm. I sort of think of it as the, um, like if trauma has, if you can look at it as like um, fracturing into smaller pieces. So sort of like what's happening within a home uh, of a traumatic event. So I think using the pandemic as well as the war that my family fled from, I'm kind of finding um, parallels in those two, hence the ancestors, which is the title of this painting, Ancestors 2, and also the future. The three paintings that I have in this show titled um, The Painters and Their Daughter, one, two, and three, uh, the, the girl in the pieces is a lot older than Mila is now. Mm -hmm. She's already a teenager. And I do this quite often in my work where I either go back or forward in time um, to sort of imagine and also bring back the past into the present moment. Um, it's the most exciting thing for me to, uh, as an artist to play around with the dial of time in that way, to mush time periods, um, collapse a sense of gender. Just the collapsing of boundaries is really important for me because I feel like that's a really rich space for transformation and alchemy. Um, and that's why I'm a painter. Uh, I really feel that painting has everything you need to create a space where things that you don't ex see existing in the world, you can with the paintbrush. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, it allows me to break down walls, to bring down walls mm -hmm. that I feel like are too strongly erected in the, in the world, right. um, social, political, um, you name it. And there are multiple spaces like this, different sort of planes that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, the spaces between figures aren't defined, so they are sort of melding into one another. Right. The uh, place where they are isn't really defined, so you can't tell if it's in a story, if it's in real life, if it's a myth, yeah. um, if it's in your blurry memories. Right. All of those seem possible, and between past and present, Yeah. which there's something sort of freeing and open about these unspecified 
yeah. places and times that you've created. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the kind of blurring, the liquidity, the amorphic mm -hmm. quality is really important to me uh, politically too, as a uh, solidity and solid beliefs and sort of certainty. Um, they, I kind of associate shapes and colors with sensations. So when I think of things that are formless or boundaryless, they are they are kind of buoyant. They have a sense of lighten, lightness to them and also potential for change. Whereas I feel that rigidity, sharp lines, high contrast, they are really sort of stuck into themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's much harder to shape shift. And I want to believe that my figures can uh, it's like they emerge from the background and, and vice versa. They can kind of go back into the landscape that they come from so that they're one and the same. Um, that's really important for me. And also the sense that, you know, I'll often look down at my feet and say, wow, these feet do not look like my mom's at all. Are these my father's feet? Are these, you know, my grandfather's feet? So the sense that we share DNA that gets manifested in our literal flesh, but also traits. You know, um, Mila is eight months now and she'll do these things where I totally see Josh. <laughs> but then in profile, I see myself constantly. So these ways in which we are uh, passing ourselves on constantly, uh, emotionally, spiritually, but also physically is really interesting to me. And how the seed, it's like the seed always goes on. And Josh and I always talk about the seed of ugliness always seems to be much stronger than the seed mm. of beauty. Uh, and by beauty, I don't mean like rainbows and flowers. I really mean truth, um, which is actually Mila's middle name. Her middle name is wow. Aletheia. Um, so uh, I, I feel that um, truth is um, kind of being there with, with things as they change and as they, and allowing them, sort of allowing them to, um, go in the direction that they want. I know I've heard you talk before about the spaces that you've created having some um, relation or inspiration from Greek mythology. And I love yeah. hearing you talk about this, if you could share yeah. that, that sort of inspiration. Yeah, so I really, um, when I was in, in my 20s studying psychology at UC Berkeley, I remember learning that um, when we try to retrieve a memory, we alter it slightly so that the more that you go back to a moment um, in the past, you're constantly changing it. I thought that was just so fascinating and it made me think like, if you recall a memory 20 times, like how far away is it from the truth itself? And that became sort of as a guide for painting for me. Um, like, can I make a painting that exists as a memory that has been attempted to be recalled? Um, and it's so that it still seems like it's changing, even mm -hmm. though it's a static object on the wall. I always want the viewer to feel like they are completing the painting in a way where it's not completely presented to them. But also in terms of Greek mythology, um, the myth of, um, I believe Orpheus going back to get Eurydice Eurid from the underworld, he was told um, he can get her back, but he can't look back, turn over to see if she's there until they pass the threshold. Well, he was too eager, so before they got to the threshold, he looked back and she disappeared into the underworld forever. And I just feel like that's such a beautiful way to think about um, grasping. Whenever mm -hmm. we want to grasp anything, we almost kill it. So he killed his Eurydice by wanting to look back before it was time. So I'm trying to, in a way, in my paintings, to create a moment before looking back before grasping so that they're always there but never fully solid. And perhaps that's the only way that we can have things. Maybe our um, addiction to possessing things, to having, to claiming is a disease. And perhaps uh, if we don't cling so much, they're always around. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the less you want, the more that it's there. You know, um, so that's sort of how I, I think of the paintings. Um, and Bracca Edinger, she's somebody I really love. She's an artist, philosopher, psychoanalyst. She uh, talks about that myth with Eurydice as the moment when Orpheus looks back to see if she was there as the site of trauma. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so beautiful. Um, 
as a metaphor, you know, to think about like what is it about the looking back that's traumatic? Um, and often people talk about nostalgia as a disease right. and melancholy, you know, uh, comes from, I think, Greek roots is like melancholos, which is, um, I forget now what it stands for, but it's like the kind of illness of the soul. Mm. So, you know, looking back has always been sort of associated with something not so good. Um, so in a way, I'm trying to look back while also looking forward and freeing what has been imprisoned in the past and also freeing what has been so fixated for the future. Right. I think your, your process is also so conceptual and ties into all of these themes. Um, it's both additive and subtractive at the same time. I think we've, in writing about this, used the phrase touch of erasure mm -hmm. over and over again. Um, can you talk to us about how you create these works? Yeah. Um, yeah, with this body of work, something about a really light touch was important to me. Um, so the way that I create my work is um, these are all acrylic washes, and I did that because I was pregnant, so I wasn't using these Gamsol washes, mm -hmm. even though I had a respirator on while I was making these. So everything starts out with stains. Um, so I stain the canvas, and they basically just look like random marks. Um, and I will then look at these stains for days and uh, wait for things to start emerging. A foot will come forward or a hand or an eyeball and I sort of start shaping the forms from these very kind of random seeming marks and then um, so that's already kind of a light stained touch then after I build up the layers I actually sand quite a bit to get rid of this thickness I almost think of it as um, if I have too much paint on the canvas I think of it as like sealing all the pores of the weave and the weave is really important to me in this type of work because the weave represents in some way a sense of breath, like the painting is breathing with you. Um, and I'm, I believe that breath can tell us so much about a person's well-being. You know, when you're really scared, your heart's <laughs> racing and you're breathing really fast. When you're relaxed, you're breathing slower. So I'm trying with this work to create paintings with the palette, with the forms, with the compositions that hopefully make you breathe slower. Right. Especially during this moment where everything, it's difficult to breathe slower. And you know, Corona really affects the lungs. So there's also mm -hmm. that metaphor uh, or the connection to um, breath, uh, this moment with the pandemic, but also psychologically speaking, it has a lot to do with um, what's going on. Right. Yeah. Well, I hope everyone can come in and see because really the texture, the tooth of the canvas that's doing this breathing that Maya is talking about is so palpable, it's so visible whenever you spend time with the works. So I've noticed that your color palette has changed pretty dramatically from one series to the next. Yeah. Can you talk to us about these works, which in my sort of mind feel very New Mexico, the color yeah. palettes, um, the movement feels so familiar to yeah. me in this place. I'm so glad it, it, it comes across. I don't do this intentionally, but um, Josh, uh, yesterday when he was talking to you, it's like when we were in France, Maya made all these paintings that were sort of commenting on the landscape that, where we were living in France at the time. So yeah, I mean, before we came to New Mexico, we were living in LA and my palette was really high saturation. Everything was like cranked up. <laughs> um, and I think somebody wrote about it and described it as like a feverish palette. Mm. And for whatever reason, it made sense for where we were, li where we were living. Um, you know, I feel like the light in LA is sort of bleached out. Mm -hmm. The way that the sun comes down, it kind of feels like it's scorching. You know, there's this uh, very LA sun. And when we moved to New Mexico, I, I noticed that the light here is really gentle and super subdued. And everything is like pinkish and this like turquoise everywhere. So I didn't do it intentionally at all, <laughs> um, but I just naturally started mixing these colors and really feeling an emotional reaction to them. And that's really how, um, how I work. It's like uh, my eye, my connection with my eyes and my heart and my brain either goes, oh, or mm, 
and I really trust that gut level. So when I was mixing those bright colors at first, when we moved here, like my body and everything about me was just like, no, like wow. that chapter is done. So I started mixing these new colors and it's like, okay, all right. It was kind of opening itself up. So um, also when we moved to New Mexico, life got a lot easier for us in many ways because everything was moving slower. Right. And we started <laughs> breathing slower. And there's a sense of wellness mm. and calm that we experienced that was very different from being in a car all the time and taking phone calls in a car and eating in a car that I just feel like is so bad for our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this kind of palette with the combination of how I created these forms is um, I'm hoping that the viewer can feel the slower pace that I think most people feel when they come to New Mexico. Definitely, I definitely feel that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, Maya, and thank you all for watching. The Harwood Museum will be reopening in April, so you can come see the works in person. And Maya will be back with us on April 22nd for a more in-depth artist talk about her practice and the evolution of the work that she's created. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining.